All right, looks like we've gotten some people who had a chance to log in and join us. So why don't we get started? Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar on three mistakes to avoid when migrating to the cloud. I just have a few things to let everyone know up top. One, we are recording. So if you need to leave early or maybe a colleague wasn't able to join, you will be able to view this later. Uh, two, we will be able to take questions. So please, as soon as you think of one, even if you think maybe they'll answer this during the course of the session, please go right ahead and put it into the question panel or maybe even the chat. We always prefer to know what it is you want to hear more about than to have you wait and be unsure if you should ask right away. So please go right ahead and ask as soon as you think of one. Uh, I'd like to, if we can go to the next slide, please, Tyler. I'd like to introduce our two speakers for today. Uh, in a bit, you'll be hearing from Tyler Johnson, a solution architect here at CloudBees. But for now, I'd like to pass it over to our first speaker to kick us off. As you can see, is Kelly Looney, a consulting partner and practice lead DevOps for AWS. So Kelly, do you want to get us started? Hi, everybody. This is, uh, this is Kelly from AWS. What I want to do first is kind of go through a little bit of um, uh, context for migration. I'll talk a little bit about how we at AWS think about migration, what we see as some of the core kind of core challenges. And I think I'll pass things over to Tyler and Tyler can talk about specifically some of the, the key gotchas and the key challenges uh, that CloudBees sees and, and uh, CloudBees helps uh, uh, customers uh, uh, to, to deal with. But first, let's kind of talk a, a little bit about what, what AWS sees out there. Uh, I always love this picture of uh, um, you know, a large number of containers having to fit through something that was designed for a large, uh, a single uh, ship and everything to go through. You think about uh, a large uh, uh, modern applications going forward. Again, kind of an interesting little metaphor. Uh, but, you know, today when we look at, at, at what people are needing to do to, um, to t start to migrate, we kind of see three different kind of core business motivators. You know, first of all, always kind of the, the primary thing we see out there is that there's this, there's this core need to innovate. Everyone needs to do more with software. It's, it's, it's constantly becoming a, a greater need all the time. So this need for agility, need to be more like a startup, need to do more. Okay, so that's always out there. That's always pressing. On top of that, at this point, you know, we're, we're, we're 50 years into the software and computer revolution. Everybody's got a lot of technical debt. We've got a lot of existing systems. We've got a lot of things we're already dealing with. And so what do you do about that? You know, you, you, we've, we've already got a lot of systems already in place built in a lot of different ways. So what are you going to do about what you've already got built, built however it was built, whether it was waterfall, whether you bought it off the shelf, you know, wh whatever. So, so how do you deal with what you have and focus on just what differentiates you? And then finally, how do you deal with risk? How do you, what, how do you deal with the security risks that you have? How do you make yourself, you know, resilient? So these are the things you've got to kind of weigh, you know, in looking at something new, uh, which something somewhat new, like the cloud. Uh, what, you know, you've got to consider these things as you're moving forward. And then as you get a little in a little bit more detail, go one layer deeper, these are the different kind of core motivators that we're seeing for people actually moving to the cloud. Um, and uh, over to the top left there, you know, back to innovation, agi agility and development productivity is right there at the top. You know, using the cloud, I like to think of the cloud as this, this big bag of things you don't have to do. You know, that's the advantage of it. The cloud can give you a whole lot of different services, a whole lot of different capabilities that are already in place and already working for you. So that's what gives you a lot of extra um, um, pr productivity because you can take advantage of something that's already there in a cloud that your cloud vendor can provide you that you don't have to write, you know, that's already, already probably available to you. So that's a big advantage, but a lot of the other things that we see that are just massive, you know, another kind of fundamental thing that you see with the cloud is it's this, you know, we, we went through this phase in industry where there for a while, pretty much every organization on the planet thought they needed to run their own data center. And uh, I'm not sure if that, uh, that really made sense because there's really not enough people out there that really know how to do that. And uh, I think that the advent of clouds has, done a good thing in kind of um, 
commoditizing that idea and, and, and saying, okay, there's really, that's something that can be consolidated, can be commoditized. And so now we just have a much smaller number of organizations that are in the data center business and are running data centers in a very large way. And so data center consolidation is what a lot of people are doing. They're letting other people run their data centers for them and they're running a lot fewer data centers. So data center consolidation is a great way to save money, a great way to, and we're seeing a ton of organizations that are looking at moving out of the data centers they have and moving to cloud data centers or even just reducing the number that they're dealing with. Another huge issue is acquisitions and divestitures. You know, any, any situation where you're buying or you're potentially selling an organization, utilizing the cloud to leverage IT makes a lot of sense. Rather than going out and, and um, doing something new with a, with a data center, taking advantage of just sort of cloud resources can make a lot of sense there. Um, doing something new in the area of innovation or digital transformation naturally tends to work well kind of in a cloud environment. Another thing we're seeing is facility and real estate uh, kind of decisions. You know, the, the, those things sort of um, uh, oftentimes lead uh, quickly to, well, let's use a cloud instead rather than, than, than use, rather than continue to use real estate that, that, that may be uh, way, way too expensive, uh, uh, things along those lines. So in general, you know, cost reduction, co-location, outsourcing contract changes, a lot of those um, um, uh, end up getting much more expensive on the back end. And so uh, uh, it, 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 you're much better off to move to the cloud somewhere in your, in your kind of contract space. So there are all sorts of different drivers and different reasons. I would say always the real long-term reason is to get faster and is to do more. But a lot of these other uh, these other reasons, uh, a lot of these other things can be the short term kind of factor that that really um, can can help kind of kind of turn the switch, if you will. The other kind of part of the process that we see here in general, especially as, as your organizations get larger, is there's, there's something that, there's a process you go through, which is sort of a portfolio review. People take a look at everything that they've got, and this sort of slide kind of shows a, a kind of the process that we see in a lot of different cases. Organizations look at all the applications that they have, and they kind of go through a decision-making process of what are we going to do about all the software that we have? So this is looking at all your legacy. And it's saying, okay, on the things that are going to go to the cloud, we tend to look at four different options. And, and we, we've kind of, kind of laid that out into rehost, oftentimes called lift and shift, replatform, which is we call lift and reshape, which means which means move it over, but then potentially make some changes to take advantage of some of the cloud platform, whereas lift and shift may be just essentially move it over and use it pretty much as is. That's what a lot of people did early on, but, you know, just simply moving it and running it in the cloud may give you lim more limited benefit. You're, you're, you're sure you've got it out of your data center, but it's still the same application running the same way. And then the other one is repurchase. So there's rehost, replatform, and then repurchase, which means maybe take advantage of something that's already in the cloud rather than, you know, and, and maybe not, you know, maybe throw away what you had before and take advantage of something that already exists in the cloud. So this is sometimes called drop and chop. Uh, is, is, is another term for it. Now, that's, that's kind of interesting because you're just, just maybe buying something rather than taking on the, the ongoing maintenance uh, um, and, and, uh, uh, of something uh, that exists. That's kind of interesting. And then finally, this is something that you're seeing more and more is re-architecture. So, so either rebuilding cloud native or re truly re-architecting to take full advantage of of what you can get out of the cloud platform. And this is something where I think CloudBees really provides a lot of great capability is, is giving you the ability to do your full, you know, life cycle management uh, um, uh, in the cloud, uh, taking full capability of, of everything that you can leverage uh, that's there.
Uh, and so, you know, I think Tyler will talk a little bit later a lot about some of the, some of the re-architecture kind of, of options that you may have as you go forward with app code development, your full SDLC and integration that goes on that's there. And then finally, um, in a lot of cases, people can, can choose to retire, decommission applications, or maybe just keep them where they are. You know, uh, uh, people don't don't always fully go to the cloud. Sometimes they keep some things on premise and they may wait till later uh, uh, to look at, look at some things. You know, people oftentimes stay in a kind of a hybrid world for some, some period of time. So, so retain and revisit is sometimes a, a, um, a, you know, a valid consideration. So this kind of chart is, is what, what people live in for some period of time as they move and they do the migration. And the, you know, the, the DevOps world is, is where people are, are somewhere in this chart with a lot of emphasis on re-architecting and getting the cloud native because that's where you get the real, real benefit. Uh, too many organizations have simply looked to do lift and shift and not gotten enough real business benefit out of everything that's there. Now, you know, what are those business benefits? Well, modern applications give you a whole set of things. And this is something that we've learned at Amazon from building uh, true modern applications over the last 20 years now. We've developed um, very, very large scale microservice oriented applications uh, for some time now. And you know what we try to do there is build systems with independently scalable microservice uh, uh, type, type architecture, uh, either via serverless or via uh, containers, everything connecting through public APIs such that we can update any particular microservice continuously. We can update them as we go. And, and in fact, I think that we, we calculated in 2019, we were able to do over 160 million production updates to our um, production systems over the course of a single year. So that's how constantly we're updating you know, our systems, our, uh, all our various systems uh, within Amazon. Uh, the whole point of a microservices ar architecture is that you can, you can adapt quickly to change. That is the point of it. Uh, and you can scale them globally. You can, you, you can, you can copy them and have many, many copies of them uh, such that load can be can be spread all over the world and, 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 and wherever they need to be and they can be fault tolerant so they can be highly reliable. We carefully manage state and persistence in them such that they can be uh, highly reliable and we're able to have security built in. So these are all the things that are sort of the attributes of modern systems that we're really looking for. Uh, uh, Interestingly, these microservices can be have their own choice of technology. They can be done in different languages. They can use different persistence layers, different databases. Uh, the key to them is that they're all independent. And per DevOps, they can be independently delivered by, by teams that, that run them kind of all the way from planning all the way through to operations. So uh, I do a lot of talking about that whole, that whole uh, part of the process. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about um, the specific case of working for kind of in regulated types of industries and regulated markets. I want to give an example of kind of cloud governance and where how you build systems in situations in which and this is just an example that we did for a financial services um, uh, marketplace of building cloud systems in cases where you where you're having to deal with a lot of regulatory or a lot of, a lot of rules, a lot of security type requirements, and just to give you kind of an understanding of how that sort of thing works, because I think this fits into where some of the gotchas are. We hear this a lot in cloud. It's like, hey, wait a minute, what about you know what about heavy regulatory? requirements? What about heavy security requirements? What do you do about that? And, you know, I think part of the answer for us at AWS is that we constantly deal with those. And so I want to kind of quickly talk about one example of that. And that's our, this um, cloud governance framework called F FSF, a financial services framework. Um, it's a example of, of how we build uh, this sort of, this sort of thing. Um, 
kind of the, the financial services framework overview is that we take advantage of a whole set of AWS security controls and documentation. So there's a whole set of different uh, uh, ca capabilities, APIs, and, and, and documents that we can, or, or, or and documentation that we can use to ensure that everything that we do is secure, everything that we do um, is auditable. And and is automatable, and this is what's very important as well. And this is something that that CloudBees also supports: is this ability to automate um, everything that you're doing. And this idea of building a control, and what a control is, is is an ability to take a regulation or a rule and build a piece of code that embodies that rule or regulation. And so what we do is we build what's called a control as code. And, the contr and, and, and then we build a mapping of that control. And that, that's what the control mapping maps the control to the regulation or the law uh, associated with, with that control. And so this allows us to create a way to constantly audit each one of our um, uh, regulations or each one of our security requirements uh, uh, to uh, um, to our actual systems and allows us to be able to audit and actually and allows us to be able to constantly validate uh, what we're the, the system that we're that we're building and so we, we take all the capabilities that we have to build security. We build controls as individual pieces of, um, as actual programs. And then we map these to the actual regulations that we've, that we've signed up to for our project. And then we have a validation process to ensure such that these can be externally audited and such that we can continually revisit each one of these controls and make sure that we've got the proper visibility, the proper logging, the proper, um, the proper visibility uh, uh, for that control to make sure it's doing everything that we need. So if you look at, um, uh, this actual uh, uh, program here's this this goes through the kind of the schedule for it of building the mapping uh, you know giving proactive control summary for each service uh, building the controls as code doing the control validation process providing audit support and then giving overall uh, uh, comprehensive cloud uh, governance. So that's kind of the general idea of what we're doing there. So wanted to kind of give that example. Uh, what I'd like to do now is turn things over to Tyler and have him give you some little bit more concrete kind of general um, ideas uh, or in uh, um, uh, uh, advice on how to on how to um, of, of, of some gotchas uh, in moving forward with the cloud and some things to things to avoid uh, moving forward. Thanks very much. Over to you, Tyler. Yes, thank you, Kelly. And I think uh, at this point, what we're really going to be discussing as I bring up this diagram that Kelly presented earlier is going to be the re-architecture path as you move to the cloud. And I think before we continue this conversation and where cloud views can really help with your migration efforts, partic particularly around re-architecture, specifically, you know, app code development, integrations with your entire software delivery lifecycle, and just the overall maintenance of that when you are moving more towards microservices, like Kelly mentioned, when you're moving towards modern code development within the cloud, like AWS, maybe even onto Kubernetes with something like EKS or uh, a different flavor that you might be choosing to use as well. It's important to show where some tools and processes, particularly in the DevOps space, can really help with this. So uh, before we begin, Max, can we drop a poll for all of our listeners today? Uh, I'd like to ask everyone at this point, based on what Kelly gave to you earlier, the three reasons that we see for folks really migrating to the cloud or even adopting DevOps as well. They're very common undertones here between the two. Which of these three really outline your key business objectives and reasons that you're looking to migrate to the cloud? Is it the ability to increase innovation, drive throughput to your end users? Is it the idea of reducing your risk, right? Becoming more compliant. I'm in a very federally or very governed space where there's a lot of uh, mandates, a lot of regulation. Or is it third, the ability to reduce your costs by either uh, optimizing your infrastructure or increasing your efficiency, doing, doing more with less? 
Uh, I'd be curious to see from everyone which of these, and it might be a multitude of these, are, are key business drivers to why you're moving to the cloud. So we'll give it a minute or so here, and then we'll kind of look at the poll. All right, we got some more votes coming in still. Just so everyone knows, you can select more than one if you would like to. Give this a little bit more time. Both are starting to slow down a bit. So let's say maybe it's, uh, five, four, three, two, one. That's gonna be, let's share these. All right, Tyler and Kelly, if you wanna get a look. Yeah, so awesome. It looks like we have a pretty good majority of folks that are looking to increase their efficiency and re reduce costs. So I'd say that's that's a general uh, answer that we see with a lot of these. I'd say it gets paired very frequently with the uh, ability to innovate or reduce risk because by moving to the cloud, Kelly, I, I think you'd agree with me here, uh, inherently you are able to reduce your costs when it comes to infrastructure. You're starting to leverage things that you're not maintaining yourself. You can use, start using things like Kubernetes. You can start using EC2 instances on AWS, some that can be ephemeral, some that can auto scale out. So it's always kind of a byproduct of the ability to increase innovation and reduce risk as well. Yeah, important to have that reduced cost piece in there for sure to get, to get going. So I appreciate everyone, you know, uh, contributing to the poll. I think we'll, we'll continue the presentation at this point. Uh, so as we're moving forward, I'd really like to highlight uh, where CloudBees fits into this solution, right? When it comes to your migration patterns, when it comes to your general re-architecture plans, your ability to innovate and, and change the way that you're delivering software. Um, I hope some of you might be familiar with this literature. It's about 10 years old at this point. It's written by Jez Humble and Dave Farley, two very big contributors to uh, the DORA report that comes out annually. It really details high performing characteristics and best practices when you're starting to uh, develop DevSecOps initiatives. Um, and part of this is what a general flow or what a good DevOps solution might look like where developers and testers and operations are all working from the same sheet of music and you're able to progress through your different environments to production and where some of the tools fit in as well, right? And this is still particularly relevant, even though it is 10 years old, um, you know, there's very, very few participants or, or people that are achieving a true nirvana state of DevOps, I'd say. It's never really an end goal. It's like, I'm now doing DevOps, a continuous journey. It's a kind of mind share. It's a thought process of how can we combine the efforts of our operations folks with our developers to really drive value more efficiently and more effectively. Um, and as you think of this as a diagram, so this is what they, they put out. Uh, I would like to kind of show where CloudBees fits into this solution. And specifically today, we're gonna to be talking about our CI component. It's an enterprise version of Jenkins, if you're familiar with the open source Jenkins project. Uh, focus, this is entirely on uh, continuous integration, but you'll see here, it's a very similar diagram where we can show all of these different tools that can fit into your ecosystem when it comes to uh, version control systems with Bitbucket or GitHub or any other versions of Git or even legacy versions like RTC or Subversion or Mercurial. And then you can also include the sorts of tools that you might use in your build processes and your testing and your deployment through things like Argo CD, or you could use things like Ansible or you know, Terraform to provision your environments, all of these great tools. And you'll see that how this is really incorporated is uh, where we fit into the cycle is doing the automation of these processes as you move to the cloud, right? So you'll see us in the commit stage and the acceptance stage is what we're gonna be talking about primarily today. That's all work done with enterprise Jenkins that we would like to promote to be done in the cloud. And then you'll also see as you travel further, right, some other solutions that we do around uh, release orchestration, you know, really starting to do complex releases across many different environments, building in things like uh, the thought of a continuous ATO or approval to authority to operate and then as well as feature flag management, things that we won't be talking about today, but of course, if you're interested, these are always things that we're happy to discuss. So before we get into exactly where we do things, particularly around Jenkins, we wanted to kind of highlight three key areas or key areas of focus that I think are a little bit misguided when it comes to migration to the cloud. So the first one would be, can't stop chasing waterfalls. So the idea is, Sure, I wanna to migrate to the cloud. As you're migrating to the cloud, you also need to be thinking about how can I build, test, and deploy software more efficiently, right? Be gone with those old waterfall techniques, manual handoffs, try to eliminate things like change approval boards and, and really long painstaking 
uh, process is that it's really intensive when you throw things over the fence and you wait for feedback and it's this really long loop. We want to do shorter releases, more rapid feedback loop, continuously delivering value. So when you do this, it's really important as you're re-architecting moving to the cloud and you're starting to think about how can I encompass this with my entire software delivery lifecycle, you need to figure out and find tools that can automate this, automate all of the tools that you're going to be using in your code building and code deployment. So you need options that allow you to do this most efficiently. And particularly if you're from a larger organization, you need to find tools that allow different organizations, different product lines, different teams to have their kind of freedom of choice of what they're using as well, right? We don't want to lock everyone into one standard best practice, but at the same time, we also want to set up guardrails so that they're all following similar best practices. And that's going to be a really key value driver and a key stance that both AWS and CloudBees promotes. The second would be uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So when you start moving and re-architecting for the cloud, like Kelly mentioned, there was that one uh, path that you could follow where we're talking about just a complete rip and replace, right? Let's just move everything to the cloud overnight. This is going to be easy. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've seen efforts like this, whether it be cloud migration or movements to automation. These almost always fail because it's really not just a technical change either, right? You can't just say overnight, I'm going to move all of my legacy applications. I'm going to take all of my software development all to AWS, or I can't take it all to Google Cloud or Azure, or whatever your choice might be. And then all of a sudden, I'm practicing modern best practices. Instead, it really is a, uh, a cultural shift as well, right? So if you just throw everything into AWS and then overnight, you don't have anyone that can manage or maintain this. You don't have the training that's required to, to figure out how to manage and, and really focus on your automation processes in the cloud. It's not going to go very well. So what we really like to promote instead of this is find things that can support both your legacy applications, the things that you know are day-to-day -day very important, might still reside on-prem. But as you're going to the cloud, make sure you can also do modern development for new processes and new projects and new applications that might be cloud native and cloud based specifically. So uh, a good reason to kind of think about your CI tooling or your DevOps tool chain, you can put that directly in the cloud and you can run and leverage all these great things that the cloud provides, right? Like optimizing your, your structure when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to like Kubernetes or container based builds or uh, even just using ephemeral nodes on EC2 to create things. These are really great ways to optimize and reduce your cost while also building in great security with things like pod security policies and workload identity and things like that to limit the access that folks might have to your, your build processes. But at the same time, just because you've moved your DevSecOps work to the cloud, you don't have to shift all of your applications to the cloud as well, right? You can still do releases on-prem for processes that are occurring in the cloud. So it's really important to kind of take this, you know, with little tiny bites, smaller chunks of effort as you move forward. And this is where we've seen a lot of success. So Tyler, a, a quick comment um, on, your, um, on your prior slide about smaller teams. Um, I... Uh, I see this a lot with uh, organizations, um, you know, wanting to move and, and, and start to do things. And you can always, you can almost always tell somebody uh, to find a team you trust. You know, you know, find a team you trust to go and do, you know, start at the very beginning and take it all the way through the process. And almost any organization can find one team that they trust. You know, they've got some stars within the organization or what have you. Um, and, and so they can usually do that, but then the next question is, okay, so now why can't you trust all your teams? Uh, and so that becomes the next challenge. So, you know, maybe an iterative way to do things is find one team and then find two teams and then find three teams. But the real challenge is how can you make it such that you can trust all of your small teams? Yep, I, I can't agree more with that, Kelly, right? And that, that kind of plays into the human factor of this as well, right? So if you are starting to move to the cloud, you need to find success stories. You need small wins because the folks at the top 
they just want things to work. They might not be as technically minded as the folks that we have on the webinar today or myself and Kelly concluded, right? We love the cloud, we love new technology, but you need to show that what you're investing in and what you're building out is actually driving real value. So finding really trusted teams to ensure these short wins, just like Kelly was talking about, those are critical to the success of these migration patterns. And then third, the last point that we really wanted to make, and this is something that I know while we were preparing this, Kelly and I were going back and forth and we really, really do like this point. And I think it's something that a lot of folks will get lost in, especially in the technology community is around uh, automation being the end all be all. This is the ultimate goal. If I can automate the heck out of every single process that I have in my organization, I have actually achieved success. And this could not be further from reality in my opinion. Uh, just because you're doing full-fledged automation doesn't mean that that should be your end goal, right? I don't need to just buy a bunch of tools, do a bunch of great automation. It really needs to drive business value at the end of the day. And specifically when we're talking about really regulated industries, you know, the financial world, I work a lot with federal and government customers as well. They have a lot of checks and a lot of balances and a lot of human in the loop. And to be completely honest, that's not going anywhere. That still serves a very significant purpose when it comes to you know, authorizing officials or audits going on. People need to be able to visualize, they need to be able to go in, do actual approvals by the click of a button, a review of things like bodies of evidence before it's released to production or even other stages of your environments as well. It's really important that these things are still maintained. So a lot of times this talk of full-fledged automation, this idea of automation being the end all be all, that really scares away groups like that thinking that, oh, we'll never be able to achieve things like cloud migration. We'll never be able to achieve things like true DevSecOps. That's not true. DevSecOps has a completely different meaning based on your organization and based on your goals. It can certainly help even when you have a lot of maybe manual approvals or reviews. The thing is you wanna get those approvals going faster. You wanna get those uh, collection of evidence and the, that body of, of, uh, of evidence that needs to be approved by these sorts of folks. The faster you can speed up that loop, the faster you can get it to them and get it out the door, that could be a big win for you and your teams. Yeah, to total agreement. I, I think that too often we think that DevOps equals automation, and, that, and that's just not the case. It's DevOps is about answering questions. And, and yes, oftentimes automation can help, but uh, I've had too many customers, you know, proudly come to me telling me that they've, they've fully automated their delivery only for me to hear that, that they're only they're only delivering once a quarter and and that's and they're really all that automation work really didn't help them much at all they didn't it didn't help them uh, answer questions or or get more competitive um, uh, it, it's really about getting feedback and and that's what the, the core of continuous delivery and DevOps really is Absolutely. And you know what, this is a completely different answer for each organization. And I want you to keep that in mind, just because it works for someone and they've built great best practices, let's say for AWS. Kelly just mentioned that they did what, 160, what was it a million releases? Million. In production? I mean, let's be honest here. Are our organizations here, are we going to do 160 million releases? Probably not, but we're not AWS. We're going to have to do things slightly differently. Not every organization functions exactly the same. So be you know, be optimistic, have that thought that just because automation works a certain way because you read it in a blog post here or you saw this group do 160 million releases, doesn't mean that there aren't wins to be had for your organization and they might take a different shape. So on that note, I'd like to kind of draw a parallel to what Kelly was talking about earlier. He brought up three really great points of why many groups are thinking about moving to the cloud and we dropped this poll for you all to give us an idea of, of why you're here and what's really important to you and your organization's goals is it the ability to increase innovation you know grab more market share move to production as fast as possible really drive technical improvements or is it the idea to reduce risks like we need to maintain and manage a publicly facing service or something like you know federal agencies might do uh, I need to make sure this is always up. I need to make sure we're always in compliance. I can't have any breaches. I can't be using third-party libraries that might, some sort of vulnerabilities could be introduced to my systems. I need to really mitigate as much risk as possible. Or the third, the ability to kind of optimize infrastructure and reduce your costs, which I almost say that is always, when it comes to cloud or DevSecOps, that's always a sidecar benefit to the other two as well. But um, 
it's also possible that you could be focusing on all three of these at the same time. But I want you to know that these are also really key reasons to move towards things like DevSecOps, continuous integration, continuous delivery and deployment as well. So these three are very common undertones when it comes to migration to the cloud, as well as moving and focusing your software delivery lifecycle through things like automation or through things like CI CD. And on that note, um, if you're not aware of who CloudBees is, uh, for everyone that's here, we're, we've been commonly known as the enterprise company behind Jenkins. That's where we were started. That's where we have our roots in. And we do a lot more than just that, right? We do application release orchestration. We have some, some SaaS CI tools as well. And it comes around feature flag management. So we're not just the Jenkins company, but it's really common to kind of affiliate us with with Jenkins kind of similarly to what you think of Red Hat and Linux, very similar relationship. We have a very tight relationship with the open source community. And we really truly think that Jenkins is the best option when it comes to starting to achieve those goals, whether it be reduction of risks, optimization of cost, or uh, increasing your innovation capabilities, right? It really allows you to empower your developers, shift the focus of operations more towards the space of developers, kind of put them on the same sheet of music. Let's all work together and let's really start to automate as many tools as we possibly can. Let's provide a lot of freedom so that developers can choose their own best practices and their own tools. This goes just back to the point I was making a minute ago. Not all of our needs are going to be the same. Like I mentioned with AWS and maybe our companies, we have different, different needs, different tools, different best practices. That same idea exists even within your organization across teams, right? Some teams will operate differently than others when it comes to their software delivery. And it's really important that they have the freedom to develop those best practices themselves. And we really do that through the, the vast ecosystem when it comes to plugins and integrations that are available in Jenkins. And you'll see some of the statistics in the bottom right here from the last year of what we've been able to do with the open source community and Jenkins. You know, we've done 67 releases of the solution itself. We are managing and maintaining. Currently, there's about 1,900 integrations based on the plugins, and we made uh, 2,600 changes to those plugins last year alone. And, and mind you, a lot of those plugins were added this year. So I think last year we topped out at about 1,600 when we concluded the, uh, the year. So, And even more importantly, and one thing that I think is really, really awesome about Jenkins and really great is you can find it everywhere. You can really get a lot of support at, either from CloudBees ourselves or from the open source developers. I mean, there's over 5,000 people that contribute to this on an annual basis. I contribute to it myself. Uh, it's a really great project when it comes to trying to find creative ways to solve your very unique problems. So now that I think we can see, or at least I hope that you can see why Jenkins is a really great solution and why it is you know, the industry best standard when it comes to CI, CD, it's, it's good to kind of note where CloudBees fits in this, right? So Jenkins is great. How does CloudBees make Jenkins better? And this is a great solution when we thought, start thinking about moving to the cloud. We start thinking about, okay, I heard Kelly mention smaller teams, microservice-based deployments and, and, and integrations, right? That's a great idea. Let's spin up multiple different Jenkins servers across our AWS install when we migrate up. Let's make sure that each team has the freedom to choose their own best tools and they can define their best practices. This is all very well and good, and this is a really great idea to sprawl out Jenkins and, and let it scale horizontally to multiple different instances to support these teams, something that we promote entirely. However, when you start scaling this out, you get into this world where it becomes this thing like islands of Jenkins or what I like to call kind of the wild west of Jenkins, right? Where each one of those servers is operating very siloed from each other, which isn't necessarily a bad thing because you want to keep that work kind of segregated from other development practices or maybe you have security teams using Jenkins as well. It's a good idea in the cloud now that I can spin up servers as on demand, I can keep these segregated. Really great practice. However, you want them all to kind of conform conform to one general practice, like creating syntax and declarative pipelines, making sure you're not running things like freestyle jobs or just disconnected tasks within Jenkins. Uh, pipelines provide a lot more value when it comes to end-to-end -end cohesive you know, code control and the ability to kind of work on those pipelines as, a, as an overall unit. You also don't want them using different authentication realms. You don't want them using third-party plugins that might not be vetted or no, no standard you know, compliance when it comes to the versions of these. These are all really key points that make it difficult to run open source Jenkins for enterprise needs uh, in the cloud. So what we promote instead is you can use what we have as an enterprise Jenkins platform. It's CloudBCI. Cloud 
And with Cloud BCI, what you're able to do is start managing Jenkins at scale on things like AWS. So when you migrate up, you're starting to re-architecture your whole, your re-architect, I should say, your entire software delivery life cycle. You can really sprawl out to multiple masters, support these different teams, but you can connect them all through one central command and control point. It's called a Jenkins Operations Center. That's just kind of a coin that we've termed uh, term we've coined here at, at uh, CloudBees. But with this, you're able to control things like authentication, making sure each user authenticates through something like LDAP or Active Directory or Okta Single Sign-On. And then you can give them their own permission sets and role-based access control at their master level. A master just for anyone's uh, education here, if you're not familiar with Jenkins terminology, is a Jenkins install. It's just a server. It's called a master. And then the objects that create you know, your builds, like Maven or, or run tests or scans like Sonar or, or JUnit, those are called Jenkins agents. So as we go forward, if you hear me use those terms, that's what I'm referring to. Uh, the second part is that it can be uniquely cloud native. So we do support cloud native installations of Jenkins. Like I mentioned, as you're migrating, a really great first step is to move your tools and move your CI CD to the cloud even before all of your applications are managed in the cloud. Uh, you're able to enforce best practices, create things like those, those bumpers right on the sides of our lanes to make sure that everyone is staying within compliance. They're using best practices. They're going through what we consider to be general great software delivery lifecycle and, and pipelining practices. And then you're able to manage and maintain all of these Jenkins servers at scale. Uh, you're able to update them all at one single time. You're able to manage all of the plugin infrastructure and all of the credential management all from one single uh, view. So as we're discussing this, it's kind of a nice, if I, if I bring this next slide up here, this gives you an idea of what Cloud BCI looks like from an architectural design. That operation center you see here is the purple box and all of those blue instances are Jenkins masters that can be spun up in the cloud for you. And they all connect and authenticate directly through the operation center. And then as you go to the cloud, and many of you might be thinking right now, well, I really fall in the cost optimization as I sprawl this back out and I start adding more and more Jenkins masters, this seems like it's really gonna cost me a lot of money. It's gonna be difficult to manage and maintain. Well, from a manage and maintenance perspective, Operation Center makes it very easy because you as a single person can oversee hundreds of masters that are connected to one single operation center. We have people in production doing that today. And then from a cost perspective, all of these masters are right size for that exact small team. And you can start to leverage really great things in AWS, like EC2 instances that can go into hibernation. So you're not spending money on infrastructure that's not being used. You can deploy this as containers. You can use Helm as an install pattern to where the, the actual instances themselves are very small. They're very lightweight. They will auto scale for agents and masters can hibernate. So once again, it's this very flexible architecture where you're only paying for what's being used or what is actually uh, executing any Jenkins syntax at that time. A few other points that I kind of wanted to, to make sure as well. There's a lot of shareable concepts when it comes to the CloudBees installation as well. You can store things like agents. I mentioned before, maybe you have tasks that need to run things like Maven or Sonar or JUnit or you know, Argo CD to deploy your things. All of those can be run as global agents that can be attached at the operations center level. And then they're all shared across masters as you progress forward. So you're not really managing and maintaining too many different unique instances of agents. Instead, they're just being leased out on a need to know or a need basis as they're, they're called upon by masters. So it's a really, really flexible way to run Jenkins. And if you are moving to the cloud and you really are looking to truly re-architecture the, uh, re the way that you're doing things, I really promote that you also evaluate things like Kubernetes and running, running tools like this in containers because it opens up so many more doors as well. So a few points I wanted to make, we have, we have five things that we wanted to kind of touch on to where we do things even better than open source Jenkins. And we really do promote open source Jenkins as a great tool. Uh, the first one I would say is stability. So with our version of Jenkins itself, we do quite a few things that are different than the open source community. The open source community is great. It provides a lot of great uh, innovation and new releases when it comes to technology and integrations across different tools. However, we're just much more rigid. We have actual engineering staff. We do a lot of things when it comes to vetting plugins, uh, testing them against each other, making sure that we have stable releases of the, the solution itself. We actually are now available in GovCloud for installation, and we have hardened containers that are DOD compliant 
that are available as well. They've been uh, stig to meet uh, Air Force demands. So there's a lot of things that come with a vendor back solution that make it more stable. Uh, one of the key points that I like to make is when you are using plugins, you're very reliant on the developer of these plugins. So it's nice to know that uh, we have certified and signed off on about uh, 150 plugins today that we publish with a specific version that is validated and verified. Uh, and we release that on a monthly cadence for anyone that wants to use this solution. The second bit would be the security. So managing your security from one single point of control, very, very important. Having the ability to then delineate certain types of roles and certain types of user groups, let's say, you know, QA teams, development teams, security teams, make sure they don't have any cross contamination, even though they're all authenticating through one operation center, they have different masters. It's important that they don't have visualization across each other's jobs or what they're doing, what their tasks might be. Let's make sure that they have only the permissions and controls that they need. That's very, very easily done in the CloudBees solution. You can also limit their access if you start installing things in, in Kubernetes based on the pods that they might have access to. You can also do it based on agents if you do it statically to where they can only access certain tools or certain nodes to run their jobs against. So a lot of that is built in already. Uh, the ability to uh, make sure that you have uh, enforced the versions of plugins that are being used. You can actually even go as far as the jobs themselves. So everything in Jenkins is, takes the form of a pipeline, ideally. Uh, and in a pipeline, you can actually define each time a certain Java developer or maybe a Python developer goes through, you can make sure that they're following a standard template or format of their pipelines as they process. Make sure that certain checks are in place. And if they're not, it will be uncompliant and that will not run. So it fills a lot of security into the solution as well. And on that note, when it comes to compliance, I know we kind of just touched on this with security, but the, the fact that you can really create 100% reproducible builds, you can ensure as there are plugins that you want to add, you can do everything in configuration as code, you can define the exact version of a plugin, the exact credentials that need to be managed and maintained within your Jenkins masters themselves. And you can store this all in your version control system. So you can start moving more and more towards that GitOps mentality to where this is managed and maintained all as uh, source control. And then inside of that, you can ensure compliance through like pull requests or uh, you know whatever your process might be between developers and operations as needs come in. Um, the usability, this is something I won't touch on too much because usability is deeply ingrained when it comes to that Jenkins concept we mentioned earlier. It's super extensible. There's tons of work out there that's already been done. I'm sure if you haven't touched Jenkins before, someone in your organization has done Jenkins work at some point in their career. Uh, I know just talking to Kelly when we were doing this uh, this webinar itself, he was mentioning, oh, it's been a couple of years since I had done, I know a lot of Jenkins work, but it, everyone has kind of done something within Jenkins at some point. It's very user friendly. It's been developed in this standard best practice. And the great thing is, even if you did things in open source Jenkins, they will port directly over to our version of Jenkins as well. So it's, while it's a, uh, it is a replacement, I guess, of open source Jenkins, you think of it more as an upgrade, right? We're not completely rebuilding everything. We're really trying to focus on where Jenkins as an enterprise version can be very successful, particularly as you're doing your cloud migration. And it can actually automate the migration and deployment of your applications to the cloud like AWS. So, And lastly, uh, this is something that is really, really focused on the cloud migration as well, the ability to scale. When you go to the cloud, it's really, really important that we have the ability to scale out important that we're able to map this to small teams and this allows you to manage those small teams at scale and the cloud allows you to optimize things like uh, your cost expenditure as, as you scale. So just as we're kind of continuing uh, this process, even though we're talking about this with AWS and the possibilities of running it, you know, maybe as containers or as traditional war RPM installs, it's important that you can also run this on other clouds and uh, other Kubernetes platforms as well. You can actually run it across platforms or across cloud um, too. It's very easy to get it and install it. You can do Helm, you can do things uh, like installing Docker containers locally as well, or you can just pull, pull from our downloads page to do the war or RPM install. Um, one thing that I wanted to focus on and, and that I brought up as well, when it comes to Kubernetes and when we're talking about moving to the cloud, it's something that I think everyone should be looking at and where I see very top performers when it comes to both their cloud migration goals and their DevSecOps initiatives is the ability to run things as containers on Kubernetes. There's a lot of great magic that comes with Kubernetes out of the box. Things like ephemeral nodes, auto scaling, 
there's a lot of security built in with, with pod security policies and workload identity and, and all of these great tools that we can't discuss in length today. But I do want you to know that you can run tools like this in Kubernetes, even though you're supporting the building and deployment of on-premise more legacy applications. So don't be scared. Like I said, this is a, a baby step in your cloud migration path. Uh, one extra point when it came to uh, the ability to reduce your cost specifically, when you are running, if you choose to go the Kubernetes path, when you have masters not in use, if you are using uh, the enterprise version of Jenkins, these sort of things will spin down for you on demand. So if nothing comes in, it will spin down. You're not paying for that infrastructure. And then what happens is it has an active listener that's installed in your cluster. And let's say an inbound webhook from a uh, source control uh, commit or a merge or uh, anything like that. You can even do a, an external webhook from another tool. We'll spin your master back up and execute that that task. A great example of this in an organization that I work with regularly that uses something like this or is looking to use something like this, I should say, um, is, is the IRS. So a very familiar organization that we all know uh, very well, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, they, oh boy. Have a, they, have a, uh, they have a large, uh, you know, kind of maintenance window when it's filing season where they're not really producing new software or new applications. Instead, it's all about, let's keep it up and running. Let's keep the service available. Once the filing season ends, their boots on the ground, the wheels are turning. Let's start developing for the next fiscal year for the next filing season. So during that, why would they be paying for masters or Jenkins work that's not really occurring, right? So things like this really give them the ability in the cloud with enterprise Jenkins to optimize that part of their business. Uh, and, and, you know, a few parting notes before we get out uh, today. I wanted to make sure that we keep this under an hour. And I want to thank everyone for joining as well. Uh, we are now available on AWS GovCloud as well as the AWS Marketplace. Um, we also have an AWS Quick Start that is using cloud formations with EC2 spot instances to save up to 90% of your commute co compute costs, I should say. Um, it's a very, very easy way to install CloudBees version of Jenkins. It will actually install it across three different availability zones and will install them in containers. It's, it's a really, really cool initiative that we partnered with AWS to do. And it's very, very simple to get stood up in some way that you can kind of play around with this and, and toy around with it as well. Um, a few other things is that the Amazon IAM credentials within the Jenkins Credentials API, we have tight integrations there. And you have the ability with things like the EC2 plugin, which is co-maintained by some AWS employees as well as CloudBees employees to scale VM instances as you start promoting you know, more masters and more agents. Because ideally, as you move to the cloud and you're starting to take these smaller steps towards automation and optimizing and driving your business objectives with cloud migration and DevOps, it's probably going to scale right we want it to grow we want to show that this is effective and we want it to grow uh, both from a development perspective and infrastructure perspective so it's really nice that you know we have that ability to scale this up dynamically with with partners like aws so on, on a final note just uh, for everyone that attended i want to say thank you so much um, these are some key points that i wanted to, to kind of round off with cloud bci it is a very robust, reliable, compliant, and secure, while being, being scalable solution when it comes to DevSecOps. Based on Jenkins, you have the ability to make sure that all of your development is falling within the compliance standards that you've set forth. It's really truly an enterprise grade version of a great, great tool that allows you to integrate so many things that are in your software delivery lifecycle. And it really does promote the great uh, practices that Kelly was talking about when it comes to re-architecting as you move to the cloud. It can really um, be a nice uh, vehicle for you to move to the cloud even faster and show uh, really stable results. And just as an idea of, of kind of where we are, it wouldn't be uh, very good for me not to show this where we're kind of evaluated by the uh, G2 Enterprise Leader Quadrant. And um, I do want to say that if you are interested and you found that this was really great material as well, please join us for DevOps World. It's not just about Jenkins. It's not just about AWS. It's not just about Kubernetes or on-prem. It encompasses all of these different great tools as well as open source uh, Jenkins work as well. It's a really great way to meet other 
uh, contributors to the Jenkins project, other practitioners when it comes to cloud migration and DevOps and really share stories of success or gotchas and, and really kind of generate those best practices that you can bring back to your organizations and you can learn from. It's a really, really cool collaborative kind of event. And, and I really do encourage you if you're willing to join, please join us. It starts uh, September 22nd this year. We'll all be virtually there. You're right, Kelly. <laughs> Well, on that note, I'll give it back to Max. I want to say on behalf of myself and Cloudbees and Kelly, thank you so much for attending. I hope you found this informative. If you ever have any questions, we're happy to share information afterwards. We really do truly enjoy talking about these kind of things. And thank you again for joining. All right. Uh, thank you, Tyler and Kelly. Uh, that was a really great presentation. We only have a few minutes left. I would like to get through you know, at least one or two questions. As we're doing this, if anyone in the audience thinks of other questions, please go right ahead and ask. We can always get to them after the fact offline. So put them right in that question panel, same as always. Let's start with this first one though. So I see the value of re-architecting, but what about new applications? Uh, what are some of the best practices for building cloud native? Yeah, Kelly, you want me to take that or? I'll, I'll make a, I'll make a quick comment and then I'll let you uh, comment as well, if that's okay. Uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a couple of different directions you can go. Um, I would, I would say for my part that the, um, you know, the idea is to get to something that works as quickly as you can. And, and, and um, I think that making the best use of the cloud services that you have available to you um, is the best way to do that. So uh, take advantage, take full advantages of the services that are available to you in your cloud platform. Um, I, for one, and it, I, I, I've, I've seen customers completely shocked at the, at the ability to get um, functionality working in using things like uh, serverless capabilities uh, uh, with AWS. Uh, because if they don't have to do complex infrastructure, they can immediately uh, um, uh, get things up, uh, up and run, up, up and running with that. So that's sort of the maximal uh, point of view. On the other hand, with containers, with EKS, uh, with a lot of other things that are out there as well, you can also do things very quickly. So my my recommendation is to take uh, uh, maximal use of what you've got in your cloud vendor. Tyler. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. And this kind of goes back to the points that, that I made earlier where it's like you need tools and automation that supports both new and legacy development, right? And you can do this in the cloud. And if you're specifically building cloud native infrastructure or sorry, cloud native applications, uh, to what Kelly mentioned before, find a really well trusted team, show some early success stories, you know, give those sorts of projects when you're building cloud native as this is beginning to those sorts of development groups and those sorts of teams so that you can so show a an effective path and how you can do cloud native development and you would be amazed once you can show one little thing like that to an organization it will spread like wildfire and all of a sudden cloud native development is the new norm for your organization i mean we've seen this with things like just running jenkins in a container I can't tell you how many times people told us that you can't run Jenkins in a container. And then you show it to them. And you're like, this is so much better. Like, this is the way that it should be. That's the exact same way that you can do things with, with cloud native development, right? So, so small bites and, and it'll grow from there. All right, excellent. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. So I think we have to cut it short on the questions for now. Uh, again, if you think of any more, please feel free to put them right in the chat as we're closing out, or you can always reply to your con confirmation email from this session. It'll come right to me. I'll get it out to Tyler and Kelly. Uh, but in the meantime, thanks everyone for joining. Tyler and Kelly, thank you both for the presentation. And, thanks uh, very much. That, all right. And uh, we will talk to you again next time. Thank you.